instructed to speak loudly. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, great. Thank you all for coming. Um, braving the, the post-election rain. Um, so today, I, I wanted to start out by introducing a little bit about dynamic compression in the geosciences. I will argue that dynamic compression is the, the new frontier of mineral physics, of high pressure physics. I may make some enemies here for that, we'll see. Um, and, but the, the field is literally blowing up, pun intended. And, um, and, and this, this field is, is enabling us to access experimentally time scales and pressures that span in orders of magnitude um, uh, in magnitude. So it's, it's, it's really opening up the possibilities for, for experimental research. So what are some of the questions that we can ask with dynamic compression? Uh, the most important one, the most uh, popular one, is is planet forming impacts. This is something that you all here are familiar with, um, you know, especially our, our moon forming impact. Um, trying to reconcile the suspiciously familiar isotope signatures that we see on the moon with the fact that um, we have to preserve some some remnant of primordial mantle. Um, being able to come up with uh, models that 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 can explain this phenomena do really need much better information about the behavior of minerals under dynamic compression, under shock compression. Um, another quick example is in cratering physics. And so depending on the regolith, depending on the material, the relationship between impact, impact size, and the, the eventual crater that we see, these models become much more um, uh, much more robust with, with better knowledge of how cratering actually happens, um, something that is not um, still needs to be worked on. Also, um, figuring out how high pressure minerals are quenched in meteorites. And so meteorites hold a key to the pressure history. And so this is an example here of the, the discovery of bridgmanite um, and, and showing that, that these high pressure phases are metastably quenched inside meteorites that we can actually collect on the, on the Earth's surface could actually give us information about the, 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 the behavior of, of, how, um, of how these meteorites arrived at Earth and their, their previous history beforehand. And so there are clues inside these meteorites that we need to be able to understand by understanding dynamic compression through heterogeneous mixtures, something that is not done yet to the full extent. Um, and finally, this is what I'll be talking about mostly today. Dynamic compression is allowing us to access conditions that we've never been able to access before. Pressures that correspond to the interiors of giant exoplanets. This here is a, a representation of the Godzilla planet uh, discovered a couple of years ago. 17 times the size of Earth. So it's a terrestrial planet, yet it's, it's humongous. So typically, super Earths, these terrestrial rocky planets, are up to maybe 9, 10 times the size of Earth. Um, that's actually a, 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 an overrest, an upper bound. Um, and so to understand how a body gets there that, that is 17 times the size of Earth requires um, an explanation that, that has something dramatic in it. And so being able to first um, understand what behavior minerals are in the deep interior require pressures that we were unheard of before. And so dynamic compression has become a tool not just to study materials as they're undergoing um, these compression, but also just to access really high pressures and temperatures. So some of the observations that are made of exoplanets 
um, and this is going to be particularly important for terrestrial exoplanets, are things such as size, um, mass, the atmosphere, sometimes temperature can be measured. These are actually uh, tide points with which we can actually determine what is the interior of these planets. And the connection between these two is mineral physics, being able to understand the crystal structure, the phase relationships, the equation of states. All of these measurements need to be made of materials at very high pressures to understand what is, what's in, inside of these planets and what the variety of planets out there could be. Um, but to understand even more importantly the relationship between what we see on the surface with the dynamic evolution inside, we have to be able to make measurements of um, transport properties, thermal uh, conductivity, viscosity. So all of these are all measurements that are possible with mineral physics, um, but but very experimentally challenging to do, especially at these extreme conditions. So when we start to try to interpret planets that are out there, planets that we find, rocky planets, we start by comparing it to our own Earth. Um, of course, we all know that the interior of our Earth is an iron uh, alloy core surrounded by a silicate mantle. And so if we were going to put together a terrestrial exoplanet, a super Earth, we might start with the same building blocks. How does magnesium, silicon, oxygen, iron come together? And what, what are the, some of the universal truths that we can find? Um, we, we expect that these terrestrial exoplanets will also have an iron core with a silicate overlying mantle um, if we have a similar building blocks. But the important difference between these super Earths and our Earth is the pressures that we have to access. And so I want to draw your attention to the fact that in a 10x Earth uh, planet, um, we expect that the core mineral boundary is going to be about 1,300 GPA, which is humongous. The interior pressures could be up to 4,000 GPA. The interior of Jupiter also could be either 7,000 or 8,000 GPA. We don't know yet because we don't know the equations of states of these uh, component minerals. And so today I will be focusing on the building blocks of these rocky planets and what we can learn about these rocky planets by studying these component building blocks. Magnesium oxide is going to be the first thing that I'll talk about. Um, oh, actually, before I get to that, let me quickly say a few things about experimental techniques. So we, we know here that, that there, are, there are many ways to get to high pressure. Um, the, 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 the main way that the, um, the workhorse of mineral physics is the diamond anvil cell. Um, but gas and powder guns that give you very high pressure. The Z machine, this is pulse power. This allows you with electromagnetics to slam plates into each other. This can get you to very high pressure as well. But to the pressures of the interiors of, of these giant exoplanets, lasers are the, are the only ones that can access thousands of GPA. There is no limit in pressure-wise on in using, using theory. Um, and so at these pressures, it's really only theory that we can compare to um, to be able to, to have a guidance. And so one, one example is that bridgmanite breaks down, uh, according to theory, into magnesium oxide and another uh, magnesium silicate. Um, and we don't actually know yet um, what, that, what those phases are. Um, and so the, getting experimental access and measuring this, we want to be able to, uh, to use the theory to guide where we're going. And so one of, the, um, one of the most important building blocks is MGO, not only because it's, a, it's going to be at the most lowest pressures of one of the most abundant, uh, one of the most abundant species, but it can control the, the, the properties of a conducting mantle. And I'll talk about this in a second. And so I'm going to talk today about two different projects um, that I carried out on, um, on these interiors of these super Earths. One is the MGO using shock compression. And then the other one, I'm going to introduce a technique called ramp compression, which allows us to get to very, very high pressures without melting a sample. And so to be able to study the cores of super Earths, um, I'll be using ram compression to study different iron uh, silicon alloys. And so these are the two techniques I'll be using and on two sample building blocks. So some quick notes about MGOs in the first half of the talk. Um, it goes through a transition from the B1 to the B2 cubic phase, um, about a couple hundred GPA. And this transition is really important because there's supposedly um, a, a large viscosity contrast between these two phases. And so we could actually end up with uh, two mantle, con uh, two layer convection on uh, these super Earths. I mentioned before that, that we do um, expect to make MGO out of the breakdown of Bridgmanite. Um, but the, 
the, the actual dynamics of an evolving planet will depend on this viscosity drop, the phase diagram, the Clapeyron slope. So all of these are all going to be measured in the future. I can't get to all of these now. Um, but in this study, I'm going to measure the pressure of transition between this B1 to B2 along the shock Hugonio, along one specific pressure temperature path. A uh, quick aside, um, how and why do we get to use these big lasers for shock compression? So I just wanted to quickly introduce another facility that I'm not talking about today, but the National Mission Facility. These large laser systems are available to us as geoscientists because they were built for fusion research. And so bringing materials to really, really high pressure is going to be essential for our study of nuclear reactions, uh, nuclear explosions, and um, potentially achieving nuclear fusion. And so we're so thankful that there are these big laser systems, and then we can come along with our rocks and use these large facilities to be able to achieve really, really high pressures. So the, the laser that I use in, in this work is the Omega laser system. This is a, a large laser system in Rochester, New York. There are actually two lasers. Uh, one is called the Omega laser, which has 60 beams. And then there's the Omega EP extended performance, which has four very high powered beams. And these can give you kilojoules of radiation um, that have all pointed to the exact same spot that have pointing, here I write, um, accuracy of plus or minus 16 micrometers. This is so tiny. All of this energy can converge in the same spot with an accuracy of 10 picoseconds. And so allowing us to, to use all this really powerful energy with the accuracy of being able to, to shoot tiny samples, tiny locations is really important. How do we achieve high pressure using these lasers? So a lot like laser ablation ICPMS, these lasers are focused onto a surface of a sample. Um, often it will be something like diamond or plastic. Um, it's easier to, to turn something that's low Z into a plasma. Creating a plasma immediately with this laser, with a high powered laser, creates a plasma that expands backwards. And as the plasma expands backwards, it sends a pressure wave into your sample, equal and opposite effect. So using lasers, we can actually replace impacts, replace um, the typical ways of getting to high pressure, um, and send shock waves through our sample, or any, any pressure wave through our sample. This is a picture actually taken at the Omega uh, facility during one of the shots that I'm showing. And this is just, I wanted to show this because the, it's incredible how bright the, the, the light emitted from these plasmas are. So there's no lights on in this, uh, in this laser at all, but these are both, so this is a plasma that's from the X-ray source, I'll introduce that in a second, and the other bright spot is the plasma that's at our sample. And so these two plasmas are what's creating both the pressure and the X-rays. Um, the nice thing about um, these laser systems is that you can actually have now space to point spectrometers, to have an X-ray diffraction box, um, and be able to measure different things at the same time. And so it's a very flexible technique where every year there's, there are different uh, measurements that can be made um, based on the fact that there is a wide access to be able to point um, spectrometers and, and such at the sample. All right, so a shock wave, I want you to do that first. Uh, a mentor of mine, he has the best um, definition of a shock wave. He says that a shock wave is a material's response to impacts and explosions. And so it's, it's the material response to a very high amplitude of pulse of energy. And having different materials, giving them different uh, pulses, maps out what's called a hugonia, which is the locus of states in PT space um, that correspond to how, how, the, pressure, how the sample, res how the sample uh, responds to this. And so this will give us information about the equation of state, for example. Um, and a shock compression, we can, we can determine the final density and pressure exactly by solving what's called the rankine hugonio equations, which allows us to measure a, a few velocities, such as the, the shock velocity and the particle velocity, and then calculate exactly the pressure um, and, and density that we finally achieve. And so the, the pressure expands faster on the hugonio than it does on the isentrope, for example. That's the constant entropy. One of, the one of the downsides um, to shock compression, though, is that the temperature um, goes up very, very quickly because we're not actually losing any energy to the system. It's, um, all of the energy is converted to, uh, to temperature. And so for studying the, the deep earth, for studying uh, large exoplanets, for example, 
all the materials that we're interested in studying will melt before um, they, we get to the pressure of interest. And so this will, in the second half of the talk, um, I'll be talking about ramp compression, which is a way around this. So instead of putting in a, a, a single pulse um, that immediately brings your sample to, to very high pressure, we can bleed the, ener bleed the energy in slowly, ramping up our pulse, which allows us to, instead of going along the Hugonio, instead of shocking up, we can ramp our sample to very high pressures um, without actually melting. The downside is we don't know the pressure exactly. We can't use those same equations, but there are ways around it. Um, and we don't actually know the temperature exactly either, um, but we can make an estimate based on the strength of the material. So these are the two ways we can get to high pressure um, using um, impacts using lasers. And so this ramp wave is something that by using a laser we can, we can tune, so we can dial in the shape that we want and then um, control the rate at which energy is delivered to our sample. So the MGO project I did was a shock project. I'm probably going to say that a few times. And this is a little bit of what uh, the measurements look like for typical shock experiments. And so if I have you focus just right here, so what I'm plotting here is are the two measurements typically made, the shock velocity, the speed of the shock wave that goes through the sample, and the particle velocity. This is the actual um, velocity of each individual uh, particle in the sample. And in a, in a material that does not go under any phase transitions, this is a straight line. Any kinks in that line is what gives scientists uh, the knowledge that there are, is a phase transition. And here, it, it, this is shown in, in their root paper, that, or this is root et al. 2015, that there's slight kinks that, that are, are interpreted as um, the transition from the B1 to B2 phase of MGO. And then perhaps there's another kink if you squint, there's not a big one here, onto uh, the liquid phase. And so by looking at this, you can already see that it's going to be quite difficult to find phase transitions. And this is one of the, the challenges of, of shock compression for a long, long time, is that, is that um, within scatter, finding kinks in a Hugonio is quite difficult. If we actually look at this now in pressure density space and fit the Hugonia to the low pressure region, um, you can actually see by squinting that the data points actually do um, uh, fall off of the, the extension of this Hugonio. So squinting, we could see perhaps the data actually um, diverges away from it anywhere from perhaps 400 GPA upwards, but it's hard to tell. And so this is, this is again, you know, the, the difficult part about uh, shock compression and looking for phase transitions. Another quick example of, of how little we know about MGO at high pressure, um, there is a mentor of mine that had said that this is probably the, the biggest embarrassment in the geosciences, the biggest building block. Uh, we don't actually really know the phase diagram, and we need to know this for to, under, to understand terrestrial planets. This is um, data showing the the mapping out the um, the melting curve using Daniel Anvil cell. Um, many people in this room, um, where we can see that there's a disagreement between the different studies over the years. Determining melting is very difficult to do, especially at these these high pressures. Um, if we extrapolate this data, or if we uh, also look at uh, some uh, calculations that are out there, we can again see that there's a huge discrepancy in the melting curves of MGO. So this is the B1 phase of MGO. If you squint, perhaps you might be able to tell that over time the, the melting curve goes higher, um, but there's a, a bit of a, uh, it's not completely consistent. But the, the melting point, even at 200 GPA, this is a very reasonable pressure, is, is discrepant by 5,000 Kelvin. This is a large discrepancy. We have a lot more to learn. If we move forward, um, there was actually a, a, a study using a preheated shock sample looking for a, a kink in a Hugonio that happened to find one here at around 9,000 Kelvin. Perhaps that's indicative that the higher melting curves are the correct ones. Moving forward, looking at a higher pressure, the transition boundary between the B1 and the B2 phases, there are uh, there's a few different studies that have different answers for where this phase transition occurs. This is just giving us context to the experiment that we're going to be doing. There's another study out there, two different studies, that use DFT combined with um, regular shock uh, studies that found that perhaps these, um, this transition curve was correct. And they found that perhaps the transition happens at around 300 GPA, perhaps it melts at around 500 GPA. 
But there are other shock studies out there as well that, that found that it happens at higher pressure, the B2, um, possibly the B2 transition happens at higher pressure. And so it's hard to interpret these. And so the data that we have to compare to is, is really just all over the place. So what we're going to do is we're going to come in um, with in situ X-ray diffraction, measuring the lattice level structure while we are shock compressing the sample to determine where, does, where do these transitions happen. And so the different diagnostics that I'll talk about are determining the velocity, determining the pressure, I mean, by using the velocities of the shock through the sample. This will give us pressure. Using our X-ray diffraction, we're going to get the, uh, the structure, and then we can use that to calculate density, for example, eventually. And at the same time, we're going to use a pyrometer to measure the temperature. And so with this, um, with this laser compression, we can measure um, all these different uh, properties. I'm just going uh, to strike the to, to drive home a little bit more. Um, the B1 to B2 transition of MGO is not a very big density change, um, and that's why it's really hard on the Hugonio to see uh, to see this difference. But um, using X-ray diffraction, we we can definitely tell the difference between these two. The difference in coordination number give us a very different diffraction pattern. And so this is why X-ray diffraction is so powerful. This is what the target design looks like. The laser will focus onto an ablator here. This is uh, capped on plastic. And our sample, our MGO uh, sample, is sandwiched between this ablator and a quartz window. Quartz has been studied a long, uh, many, many times. Um, and so the, the speed of a propagating shock through a quartz, uh, for example, will allow us to, through impedance matching, determine uh, the, the pressure state within the MGO. And so it's our window. Um, so this is just saying that again, that we input a laser drive, this is actually a, a, uh, what the laser power looks like, it has to increase uh, slightly with pressure, getting the slope was actually quite difficult um, because the plasma is actually expanding um, laterally in addition to backwards and so the laser power has to be um, increased to be able to maintain a steady pressure rate into your sample. But we'll measure from the other, the other direction, we'll measure um, downstream the reflected um, the re reflected, using a reflected laser, we'll be measuring the, uh, the, the velocity of the interface. And then also at the same time, we'll be measuring the, the temperature. So our main diagnostic is uh, using an x-ray source. And so while the laser is being focused onto our sample, I drew these slightly to scale to each other, where we can see that there is a large, uh, much larger uh, laser spot size than the sample that we're probing. We will start, uh, we will create an x-ray uh, source by shining um, perhaps 40 beams of the 60 beam facility onto a piece of metal. And so we can either use copper, iron, most recently a big development was the use of germanium. Um, and when these are turned into a plasma themselves, they'll emit, depending on the temperature, they'll emit x-rays um, that correspond to a mostly a helium alpha um, emission. And you can see here there's slight little bumps. This corresponds to the hydrogen emission. This is the helium beta, helium gamma. So we have a mostly monochromatic source. And depending on the temperature of the plasma, we, if you accidentally over ionize, for example, you get a higher hydrogen peak. And so the, the, monochromatic, the, the monochromatic source is tuned by uh, the, the laser power itself. When this is turned into a plasma, x-rays are emitted in all different directions. And so to be able to do x-ray diffraction, we put a pinhole in front of our sample, which allows us to colony the x-rays. So only the ones that, that uh, diffract off of our sample will get through this pinhole and then can be uh, measured uh, on image plates. And this is what this diagnostic looks like. These are, this is called the picture diagnostic powder x-ray diffraction using image plates. Um, it's basically just a box, a um, couple centimeters by a couple centimeters. Um, where we line the inside of the box with image plates. We put our sample on the edge of the box with its pinhole, and then behind the sample is where we have the x-ray source. And so while the, the sample is being driven using a couple lasers to very high pressures, we'll, and this, will, this whole thing will take maybe 10 nanoseconds, we'll turn on our x-ray source for about one nanosecond and measure a diffraction pattern. And then there's a window in the, in the back of the box for us to measure our, our visor. Our visor is a velocity interferometer where we shine a green laser onto the sample um, off of a reflecting surface. Um, and in this case, we're actually measuring the reflecting shock 
So as the shockwave is passing through, especially passing through the quartz window, the, the, the shock front itself is reflecting. So we can measure the speed of that uh, shock wave by measuring the, the Doppler shift of the interface that's moving uh, towards, the, uh, towards the laser. And so these are, are, are measured. Um, so this is distance on the y-axis and time on the, on the x-axis, where a street camera, as a function of time, gives us these, these jumps in, in fringes. So this is measuring the, the shock wave entering the MGO. This is measuring the shock wave entering the, the quartz. And so by using, um, by basically doing a Fourier transform, we can then back out the velocity and then determine the, the pressure. Oh, I already talked about this, so I'll, I'll move on. So this is all done simultaneously in situ. Okay, so I, these, this data is a little bit hard to look at, so I wanted to, to walk through uh, one of these just as an example. So I, was, I said that there were image plates inside the box that we pull out. This is an example of one of them. The pinhole itself on the corners also diffracts the x-rays, and this is what we use to, to calibrate the location of the image plates. And so these really bright lines are tantalum uh, corresponding to um, the pinhole itself. And then using, a, a, using Igor, then we can take this and take these different image plates and then project it into different uh, projections. So this is a stereographic projection showing the, the, uh, the pinhole lines here as well. I mean, this happens to be a, a sample showing um, at 500 GPA the B2 structure of MGO. These are the fact that we could see two beautiful lines was 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 really exciting. Um, I'm going to quickly walk through um, a few of the pressure points that we saw. So I'm starting at the lowest pressure at 177 GPA. So this sample happened to be polycrystalline, and the the timing of the X-rays is such that you try to do it so that the X so that the laser or the, the shockwave pulse is going through your sample and hasn't reached the window just yet uh, when, you, when you turn on the x-rays so that you know that there's one constant pressure uh, in your sample. Once it, it reaches the window, it actually will start releasing the pressure because of reflections. <coughs> and so this is why, because the shockwave hasn't been exactly all the way through the sample yet, we see a combination of ambient pressure B1. You can see that the ambient uh, material itself is really uh, spotty, and so the diffraction peak is quite messy. It can be distinguished from the, um, the compressed B1, and so we can see here at 177 GPA that the sample is still in the B1 state. And again, here in the right panel, um, you can see the, the diffraction line from the, the B1 MGO. So this is unequivocally telling us again that, that we're still in the B1 uh, um, phase. Um, so if we switch then to, we, we did a whole bunch of polycrystalline samples, figured out that they were so messy it was hard to see, so we switched to single crystal. This is an example of that, where we only see one spot from the single crystal of the B1. This happened to be one where um, our timing was slightly off, where we actually caught the sample, um, we actually caught it as the, the shockwave had just entered into the quartz. So this is why there's a little doublet here. Um, but it's a single crystal peak corresponding to the B1, and this is at 400 GPA. If we set the higher pressure, 415 GPA, this was a really cool shot where we saw um, peaks from the B2, so these are nice powder peaks, in addition to a single crystal peak corresponding to the B1. Um, and I wanted to also point out that there are other spots. Um, these are really messy images because there is a lot of background so the, the, the x-ray, or the, the drive using the lasers creates a lot of x-ray background because um, the plasma itself is, is, is producing x-rays. And we also get diffraction off of quartz, that's what this is here. So the quartz window diffracts. A lot of different things uh, diffract. Um, and so often we have to rely on texture to tell the difference. And so looking at all the different despacings, we can, we can figure out which samples are which. So this is a B2 peak here. This streaked line here is is from the quartz itself. Um, so at 415 GPA, we saw a coexistence of both the B1 and B2, which was really cool. Stepping up to higher pressure, um, we, we found that at 500 GPA, we only saw the B2 on the higher pressure phase. That's this one here. You can see it's harder, to, harder and harder to see because of the plasma background. That's why it's getting quite, quite grainy when we try to um, subtract out the, um, the plasma background, which is this um, um, this, uh, this darker, circle-ish 
here. So this is from the plasma background itself. Um, and then finally, at, at the highest pressure, this image didn't render, sorry about that, but we can focus on this one here. We only see um, lines from our pinhole here, and then all these little tiny spots, those are actually from debris from the, the sample actually um, tearing into the filter. And so um, whenever we don't have enough filters, we have to reuse them. And so these tiny little specks all over the place are left over from debris. But at the highest pressure point that we reached, 670 GPA, we saw no peaks from our, from our sample at all. Okay, so putting these all together, we can map out the phase diagram using the X-ray diffraction that we, that we measured in addition to the temperature that was measured using this pyrometer. And so we see that at our lowest pressure point, um, we see the B1 phase, and then we see a mixture of B1 and B2 over a range of pressure points. Um, this gives us insight into the, the latent heat of transformation. We see only B2 for a while, and finally at our highest pressure point, we see um, uh, what's consistent with melting. And so we're convinced that we're, we've mapped out the, the PT diagram. And so this is the, the, the first unequivocal um, measurement of the phase transition um, undergoing shock compression. And so this is a conclusion for the first half where we did make this measurement. And although we don't actually have a definitive um, evidence for melting, lots of diffraction peaks here we're, we're interpreting as melting. Um, but there are other things to consider um, as we move forward. And so looking at the, the influence of kinetics, perhaps the, this mixed phase region exists for a longer pressure range um, than, than it really should because of kinetics. We have to you know, do more work to figure out what is that effect. Um, and then in the future, mapping out the phase diagram is going to be really important in terms of determining the, the Clapeyron slope. And so doing a double shock experiment in the future is one that I'd like to do where uh, we can then measure uh, what is this Clapeyron slope. And then putting these uh, measurements into an EOS model allows us to then interpret um, what would actually an evolving mantle look like. Uh, what what would the um, what would the the, the influence on um, the phase transition pressure be if we were going to be cooling down a mantle, uh, for example? Okay, switching gears really quickly. Um, the the next project I want to talk about is using um, iron silicon alloy as a model for the cores of these uh, terrestrial exoplanets. A uh, quick few notes of introduction. Um, we, we chose silicon um, because we, um, we, we knew that, that nickel did not change the properties too much, and silicon is a strong candidate for uh, one of the light elements in the core. Eventually, we'll be expanding out to doing more, um, more complicated chemistry. Um, and even in our own Earth, there's a bit of um, controversy left as to what the actual stable phase is in our inner core. We don't have that solved yet. And um, perhaps if we had a, a composition that was 70% silicon, this is, this is roughly reasonable for um, a, a, an estimate for the composition um, of silicon in, in the core. Um, there have been uh, indications that perhaps at really high pressure and temperature, it breaks down into a mixture of phases. Um, and so solving it for our core, in addition to asking questions about higher pressure, is what motivated us here. And so I did two different um, compositions, seven way percent, the more reasonable um, composition for um, ter terrestrial uh, planets. And then just to see what happens when you add a lot more silicon, 15 way percent silicon is the other composition that I did. So this could be a, either a very exotic planet or just uh, out of curiosity to see what silicon does. Um, we use the same diagnostic that I've already introduced, the picture dip for extra diffraction, and then using Visor to track the velocity. And ramp compression is actually really, uh, really interesting because, as I mentioned, you can't use the same um, conservation of mass, momentum, and energy equations to determine exactly the state in your sample. And so we use, we take advantage of, of the, the high strength of diamond, um, and we, we uh, sandwich our material in between two diamond plates. And knowing that if we, um, if, we, if we put a ramp compression, if we put a pressure wave into our sample, because the um, impedance of these two, um, because the density of these two, the, the bond strength is very different, once a, a pressure wave reaches an interface, there are multiple reflections. And so with, with a thin layer in between two materials that we actually know the pressure density relationship of, um, we know that, we, that with multiple reflections, 
um, that the pressure equilibrates very, very rapidly. And this is what we rely on um, to, to measure the pressure in our sample. And so with time, as you ramp, um, ramp up the pressure wave, the sample will equilibrate. Um, and then when we measure on the free surface, this is where we take the measurement of the velocity, we can then, using the characteristic equations um, describing a diamond, we can then back calculate what the pressure was at the sample itself. And so even putting a pressure hold on, then we can see, we can translate this um, measured free surface velocity back to um, our sample itself. And so we just integrate backwards. Here's an example of it showing the timing. Um, and this is something that I, that I wanted to mention before too, is the timing of, of these experiments is, 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 is key. Um, our our x-ray, our laser input pulses here, you can see it's stitched together a few different pulses, a few different laser beams to create a ramp shape, a vaguely ramp shape. Some of these wiggles you can see are from anomalies in the actual laser pulse itself. They get smoothed out in the ablator, smoothed out in propagation through the plastic, um, or sorry, through the original diamond. Um, and this is the visor record that we see. And then the characteristic analysis using uh, these equations on the right here, allowing us to determine what is the pressure in our material um, when we sample it using the x-rays. And so for all of our, our pressure points, this is the analysis that we do to determine what was the pressure at the time that we sampled. Here are some uh, samples of the x-ray diffraction patterns that we see. So this is for the 7 weight percent silicon. Um, we can see that um, these lines in the blue and green are a little bit hard to see, but these bright lines are the, the pinhole. And we saw three beautiful diffraction peaks corresponding to the hexagonally close-packed iron alloy at the entire, actually over the entire pressure range that we saw, it was, it was in the HCP phase. At lower pressure, we could see all three peaks. At much higher pressure, this weak 002 reflection um, um, was harder to see, and so at high pressure, you could only see um, the two stronger reflections. But over the pressure rate that we sampled, from 130 GPA to 1,314 GPA, we saw the HCP structure. And back when we made this measurement, uh, 1314 uh, 14 GPA was the record for the highest pressure diffraction pattern achieved. Um, and I was really happy about that, but that record only lasted for a couple months before someone else came <laughs> up and, and made a different measurement. And this is just a testament to how fast the field is changing, that every couple months a new record is actually uh, made in the highest pressure as we're all developing these techniques. Putting together these diffraction patterns and calculating a density, we can put together a pressure density curve and compare it to what we know um, from other experiments. Down here is the static compression data. We're comparing it to diamond anvil cells. Comparing it to the extrapolation of that, we actually see that, um, that the extrapolation of the lower, um, lower pressure diamond anvil cell experiments is not too bad. It, it is pretty consistent. Um, and so comparing it to iron, this is the iron isentrope here, um, we can definitely see that adding in silicon lowers the density. That's reassuring. We should be seeing that. Um, but at this point, I wanted to say that, that when ramp compressing a material, we're actually approximating, um, especially in pressure density space, the isentrope um, of the material. So this is within, within the errors that we have. Um, when you ramp compress a material, the, the smoother the ramp um, the closer and closer it actually is to an isentrope, especially in density, because at these really, really high temperatures, or really high pressures, I mean, the effective temperature on the density is not very high because you know, you're already compressed uh, so many fold. Um, and so comparing it even to the isotherms, this is you know, not too um, unsurprising that, that we, we are quite consistent. And so this is a way that we can get a, a sense of an equation of state of the material because it's actually really difficult to measure density using ramp compression. Um, there are ways to do it using step targets with a really, really nice laser uh, beam at the NIF at, NIF, at the National Mission Facility. Um, it's really not possible anywhere. So really, using s refraction to give us, the, dense, uh, give us the, the structure is also one of the best ways for us to measure uh, densities at really high pressure. Uh, moving then to the 15 weight percent silicon, uh, we measured only the B2 structure, the cubic structure, over the entire pressure rate that we sampled. And so here we can see just one line. So this is very different from what we saw for the 7 weight percent. And we see just one line corresponding to our, our cubic phase. 
And you can see here at really high pressure that the diamond, so this is, you can tell this from um, difference in texture, the diamond peaks um, are getting smeared out as, as the diamonds are being broken up. And so they don't stay single crystal for very long, but they stay single crystal much longer um, than, than any other window possible. And so with the entire pressure range, we only saw the B2 structure. And we did the same exercise where we used this to calculate the density and compared it to the iron isentrope here. Um, the extrapolation of the isotherms are a little bit um, are more difficult. They're, the equation of the states don't agree with each other very well, but you can see that um, they, um, they're, they're vaguely close to where we are. So this is our ramp compression curve. This is the extrapolation of the isotherm. Uh, but some of the different isotherms out there, by extrapolating way beyond where we actually should be extrapolating with low pressure data, um, they weren't very consistent. So again, using this ramp compression is going to give us our sense of equation of state. And so here, we, you know, these, these fits um, were as guide to the eye, we fit um, a Binet equation of state through them. And we can use this equation of state then that we measured, these guide to the eye, to say something about general trends uh, with um, adding in silicon. Um, the error bars are still really big, but if we subtract the density difference um, from the iron end members, um, our general conclusion is that when you add in silicon, the compressibility um, does not change very much. So perhaps you can approximate the effect of silicon just by the density change by adding in a different, um, by adding a light element. So that's one approximation that we can make when we move forward to model. And eventually, if we study more materials, we'll be able to see uh, this, a, a change in compressibility, perhaps. That would be really interesting. Or we could get the, the error bars down much, uh, much smaller. So um, as an example of how we can use this data, um, there are, of course, many, many um, equivalent ways to model a planet, for example. Um, there are so many different elements that we have to start exploring, so many different building blocks. But we can see, um, as a test case, what's the, what's the impact of using a different equation of state to model the interior of a planet. Right now, um, the, the state of the art seems to be um, using extrapolations from low pressure. Um, there, have been, there are studies out there that are actually just fitting an equation of state to prem, extrapolating that to very high pressure, um, not, not based on a, a mineralogical you know, reason. Um, and so we can see what the influence is of incorporating um, chemistry into our models. Instead of just making a planet out of MGO and iron metal, what happens? So this is using um, a publicly available software called Burn Man, um, where we, we put in a, a chemist, chemical model uh, for a planet. So here we're putting in um, a typical pyrolite uh, mantle uh, and seeing what happens if we use a different model for the core. What happens if we consider chemistry on the core? And we can see that there's a huge difference. Of course, I'm using the 15 weight percent. Um, just, it's you know, much clearer of a trend to see the difference. But even just comparing um, the difference in chemistry, the density difference at the center of Kepler 10b at three um, x uh, planet, three times the, the Earth mass planet, you can see that the density difference at the, uh, at the center of the planet is, is five grams per, per cc. It's a large difference. The difference in the core metal boundary location is different by hundreds of kilometers. And so this is the, the first, uh, the, the first statement we can make about how important it is to have the chemical model right. And so moving forward, we're going to be looking at ways to incorporate different uh, variations in chemistry. If we look at the interior pressure, for example, also, we can see the pressure is going to be different by 200 GPA, just at the interior of this planet. And so this is also another, um, another point of, of how we don't know yet the pressure of the interiors of planets that we observe, because we need to know the constituent materials first before we make these models. So there's a lot of work to be done, um, but this is the first step where we are looking at the influence of different, uh, different chemical substitutions. And so again, I wanted to reiterate that this is you know, one of the, the first experiments where we can actually measure the structure of, of the core um, at the actual conditions that are relevant to the exoplanets, not just extrapolating from lower pressure. We're actually ramping samples up to the, the pressure um, and maybe likely the temperatures that, that, that correspond to these. Um, the, 
the, the, the two different alloys were, were actually different structure. The 15% was, was in the B2, 7% was in the, the HCP structure. Um, but the one caveat I will say is that the 15% um, we expected, based on diamond naval cell experiments, that they should actually break down into a small proportion of HCP and B2, uh, based on one study out there. We don't actually see that breakdown during a laser compression experiment because the time scales of diffusion are, are, are so, uh, so much longer than our experiment. And so there have to con we have to consider the effect of kinetics on our measurement um, when actually making real interpretations of what we see at these high pressures. And so that's a, a, a field of a, a huge direction that we need to go into to be able to understand what's happening at really, really extreme conditions. But the implications of, of these studies for the phase diagram, um, for example, are, are really important as we can, in the future, map out the different phases that, we, that, that these alloys go through. And of course, even interpretations of the planetary interior structure will rely on these phase diagrams too, because we're using equation of states of solids here. It could very well be melt depending on the temperature. And so there's a lot of work to be done. All right, so um, I talked about two of my experiments that, that I did at the Omega Laser. I just wanted to end in the last few minutes uh, with a few notes about what else we can do in the future, um, what, where I think this field is going in terms of dynamic compression. Um, and, and this is partly motivated because I uh, have been able to do it, been lucky to do experiments at many different facilities and ask many different types of questions, but only to come talk to you about some of them today. And so in the future, um, Every year, it seems, there's another facility opening up or another capabilities opening up um, that allow us to mix and match different ways of getting materials to high pressure with different ways of measuring them. So putting um, a gun, for example, at the synchrotron, at the APS, is a big development, allowing us to ask questions on longer timescales, microsecond timescales, rather than nanosecond timescales. You know, comparing microsecond to nanosecond to static compression is going to give us access to huge orders of magnitude of strain rate. Um, in addition to um, be able to measure with um, the resolution of either nanosecond, this is several picoseconds, this is 50 femtoseconds, um, we, can, we can ask all different kinds of questions. And so one example um, that, I'll, that I'll quickly mention is that you know, one of the things that I glossed over when talking about this laser compression experiment is that um, that the kinetics of transformation um, are something that we can actually measure, that we can access by using different, uh, different techniques. And so this is an example of an experiment that I did looking at the B1P2 transition in sodium chloride, seeing it as it decompressed back to ambient pressure, and seeing that we actually have a hysteresis effect that we can see in the back transformation that's time dependent. And so we can actually catch the time scale of phase transitions uh, using the comparison of lasers to gas gun, for example. And so we could, we could actually ask questions such as, how do these different strain rates affect what we see? Um, or what we actually seeing are indicative of, of static high pressure planets, or is, is everything that we're seeing a, uh, an artifact of measurement, for example? Some other questions that we can ask are, are questions about um, diffusivity and time scale. And so you know, with the flexibility of these lasers, we can actually take advantage of the fact that we're using uh, lasers and plasmas to drive them to very high pressure to do experiments such as this, which I'll be doing later this year, uh, measuring the thermal conductivity. How long does it take for a, a, a temperature pulse to make it through the sample? And so it's not going to just be structure that we're going to be measuring in the future. And so watch out for, for papers that are, that are about measuring things like conductivity, viscosity, um, diffusivity of different elements at these extreme conditions. Oh, and finally, uh, one future direction also that many people are going to be interested in the future are looking at comparison of the in-situ measurements that we make of X-ray diffraction, for example, compared to a recovered sample, which for a long time was the only way we could get information um, to compare to these velocity profiles. And so seeing here, so this is an example of an experiment where we uh, shot graphite into diamond and then recovered graphite afterwards seeing what it looks like, what the texture looks like under SEM, this allows us to reproduce, basically, meteorite impacts, for example. And so there's a, there's a lot of different questions to be asked there. So I finally just wanted to end on this slide, where um, in the future, we'll be coming up with new different ways to ask questions about 
material at, at, at extreme conditions. And if anybody's interested, I'd love to collaborate in the future um, and, and see what else we can ask. All right, and with that, thank you for your time. Yeah, so it was consistent with one of the, the theoretical calculations, but, but so there was a range, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were actually, our measurements were consistent with the other laser compression experiments. So this is actually a difference between the experiment and what's been calculated uh, using the DFT. And the, really the, the, the free energy difference between those is, 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 not, is not that big, and that's why these measurements are so important. And so, um, that's just stating the, the same thing I said before, but we are consistent with the other laser uh, studies out there using the decaying shock measuring the temperature. And so the, I mean, really the, the big difference is that we're the only ones, as is the, the decay shock laser ones, actually making a measurement. Everything else is using the DFT. Um, or squinting at studies that, you know, where, that had very sparse um, but very large error, error bar data points. And so this is an, ex an example of, of why it's, you know, as we get to higher and higher pressures, if the only thing that we can compare it to is, is DFT, um, you know, it's, it's something that perhaps could then, then feed back into the DFT calculations where we figure out, is there actually, are there new effects that we haven't taken into consideration uh, when doing, doing the modeling? Um, on that same study, it looked to me like the pressure temperature anomaly uh, made it look like the transition was kind of complete, but then your diffraction shows that. Ah, yes, that's actually a, a, a good experimental uh, observation. Um, so one, one, so this is why understanding how the experiment happens is, is really important, and you shouldn't just trust someone that stands up here and tells you the answer, because the the extra diffraction is measuring the entire, um, you know, the, the is measuring the the entire bulk of the sample. You're going through the whole thing. The temperature measurement is only measuring the skin depth, about one micrometer, um, um, front in the shock uh, front, because you know after that it gets too opaque, um, and so it, it self absorbs. And so where are we making the measurement of temperature from, and we're making the measurement of extra refraction from is slightly different. And so this is you know this is the mismatch that we're seeing here. And so um, does that explain the difference? Is the kinetics of transformation where um, where it, does it take a little bit of time for the B1 to transform into the B2 behind the shock front? Um, so those are the two things that we can't actually uh, distinguish, you know, in our experiment because um, you know we only have what we can measure, and so that's a it's a really good observation and we don't know the answer to it yet. Is it kinetics or is it the skin depth measurement that we're making? And this is another point of of, of why just using this temperature measurement is dangerous. Why just using a velocity measurement of an interface is dangerous because you know, behind the shock front is where you, you approach closer and closer to equilibrium. And so even if we change time scale, um, will this overdrive, in quotes, um, it be as big if we do an experiment where we can hold it for longer than 10 nanoseconds, too? And so there's a lot of worms, cans of worms to be opened there. But yeah, good question. So, so uh, you mentioned that uh, this is all good, and if you look at the densities, and uh, one of the things that actually I have been working on the Z machines in the last few weeks, um, several months. So we actually started looking at the, uh, doing velocity measurement. Okay. So what's the position? Is anyone doing velocity measurement in the laser shark community? And uh, where, where this will go? So we are, so to, to get where we are in pressure is using the velocity. And so we're measuring the, 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 sh the shock wave velocity through the sample and then through the window. And so that's how we determine what the, temp what the pressure is. And so the only way to determine temperature is by doing the actual measurement. And so we're, we're doing, it's the same measurement where you, you measure the velocity at the interface. So, so you are across the mountain, you can get to the DP and the... Uh, ah, so that's a different that, kind of measurement. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm that's a different kind of measurement. Um, not that I know of. Is the answer to that. Um, so making a measurement of sound velocity is, 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 
a different type of experiment entirely where you, where you actually rely on, on timing it so that you can measure um, the, um, so you, you, you design your experiment so that you can measure both the, uh, the, the velocity of the, of the shock wave in addition to the, the, the P wave. And so, so these measurements are only looking at the interface. 